Välkommen till learn.tech, en läringsdugnad om teknologi och samfund med Silvia Seres och vänner. Hey and uh, welcome back to Learn Masters. I'm Silvia Seres and my guest is Maria Saxjarvi. Uh, and the topic is uh, digital marketing. Hey Maria. Hey Silvia. So this is our second session on digital marketing. And we talked in the first one about the background of the subject, the history and uh, how um, a basic process could look like for getting um, on with digital marketing. Uh, in this session, we are going to focus on your favorite examples. Before we do that, we're going to go back to a couple of points that uh, we didn't have the time to cover in the first one. And it's definitions of the most commonly used methods in, uh, in digital marketing. So we'll basically go through the list. And if you could give us a short explanation of what each of those are. And I would like to spend five minutes talking about the myths as well. Sounds good? Yeah. Excellent. So, um, so if we get started, you listed um, some of the most common methods for me, and I'd like to get a feel of what they mm -hmm. are and how I can think about them in my mix of digital marketing. So it's social media marketing platforms, influencer marketing, email marketing, content marketing, search engine optimization marketing, video marketing, and web, web ads. Can we go through the list? Yes. So let's start with the social media marketing. Uh, that's basically, as the name says, uh, any kind of marketing you do on social media platforms. And uh, this has become very, very popular. And uh, Facebook, for example, allows any company to sign up uh, on, their, um, on their page to launch ads um, for their audience. And uh, sometimes the ads are more successful and uh, sometimes they are less successful. Uh, I think we all have experiences when we look at our Facebook feed and wonder, why do I see this ad? Um, I, for example, got an ad for men's underwear, which... Um, you love me. <laughs> uh, it, it was uh, interesting, but uh, not uh, something that I particularly thought that I would uh, necessarily need. So you sometimes you wonder why... Yeah. The companies choose to advertise how they do, but okay. Can, can I ask you, Maria? Because mm -hmm. um, so so uh, I was actually surprised at how efficient it is in you mm -hmm. know selling me a particular kind. I like I mm -hmm. love woolen scarves, mm -hmm. and so there is this uh, Chinese company that has somehow found me. I get lots of other mm -hmm. kinds of cool scarves as well. Mm -hmm. I get new, interesting, uh, very efficient ladies' clothing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mm -hmm. the sort of a dress that looks good in the morning and in mm -hmm. the evening and you can travel mm -hmm. and very, and, and very nice uh, woolen stuff as well. So they, they seem to have figured out, I guess it's more simple than I think I probably bought from somebody and then the others found out about it or, I mean, it, it is surprisingly efficient, makes me buy things I didn't think I wanted. Yeah, to no, no, no. Uh, it, it works. I mean, that, that's something that we can say that it works. Uh, I think for a person who has very eclectic interest like I do, I'm interested in so many things and I click on so many different things that they just have a hard time figuring me out. Uh, if you're a person with clear preferences, uh, then it's, as you said, it's quite efficient. Um, well, it starts so you, and video recording equipment, yeah. and cameras. That yeah. Kind of... Yeah. But so, Maria, so, so, no, no, so, so what I wanted to ask you about is that I think uh, I and many others are confused a little bit about, uh, you know, a difference between a Facebook. So when we say a Facebook campaign, mm -hmm. is it something that you publish in the feed of your company and then tag lots of people and it's that kind of a push or is it more that you create an ad program? So these days uh, it's more efficient to embed it in the platform like Facebook, and then you pay a small fee uh, to Facebook, and then you can choose the parameters. Um, so let's say that you want to target the females um, age 25 to 35, living in a specific area, and so forth and so forth. Uh, and then you pay uh, to Facebook for that. 
of course you can uh, do things on your own page as well, uh, but it's often less effective, uh, partially because people who follow your page, they probably like you anyway, and they probably buy from you already. Um, so that may not represent a new business opportunity uh, as much as you can do by exposing a person who likes similar things, but hasn't quite bought from you yet uh, to your specific product. That's a very important point because, you know, let's say in Learn, we keep pushing things out on our pages. And of course, they keep mm -hmm. reaching the, we are preaching to the choir. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. While the real goal is getting uh, the learning habit out to the other people who still don't have it and don't know about the opportunity. But of course, it also depends a little bit. I mean, your company is in a growth stage. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then that's the absolute best thing that you can do. Uh, but if you are, let's say you're a market leader, uh, you're very comfortable in your position, then you don't necessarily have to do that because then it's more about keeping your existing customers happy. Mm. So it, it, it also depends on uh, the type of company that you have and the specific phase that you're in. Uh, if you are a market leader in a very specific market, you don't have to work as hard. I mean, that's just the truth. Um, and the more specialized your equipment is, uh, let's say you produce medical equipment for um, healthcare professionals. Uh, it's very, very specific. Uh, and you are the only one in that niche um, that you are doing. Uh, let's say you have optimal imaging devices uh, that are just, no one has anything comparable. Well, okay, in that case, you don't have to work as hard. Uh, first of all, because your audience is quite limited in the sense that um, there are only an X amount of people who use that kind of equipment. Um, but if you if you are a company that has a product that, that can virtually be used by anyone, then of course you want to reach as many people as possible. And you especially want to reach people who will likely like your product, but has not yet purchased from you. So that's, uh, I think that was a great, uh, actually, new point for me. Uh, I, I was thinking that, you know, you do either one or the other, but very unconscious. But I think one is very good for growth stage mm -hmm. and reaching out to new people. The other one is really important for uh, stopping churn. Mm -hmm. and uh, keeping up the, the, the audience that you have mm -hmm. uh, in, in an active mode. So that was the social media marketing platforms. And mm -hmm. there is a Facebook, there is LinkedIn, uh, there is Twitter, Instagram. Twitter. And, and uh, again, choosing which one you focus on most will depend on where you think your audience is. Yes. And uh, of course, uh, Instagram is owned by Facebook. So that has changed a little bit. Um, the operations of the platform. Uh, in the old days, when Instagram started, it was very highly curated. Um, they only allowed uh, a certain amount of ads, and the ads had to be very, well, uh, let's say aesthetically Relevant. pleasing. Mm -hmm. uh, you, it could not be a shoddy ad. They wouldn't allow you to, to, to launch that uh, because the founders of Instagram had a very strong vision that Instagram should be very aesthetic. Uh, and if your ad didn't meet that uh, aesthetic criteria, they didn't want your money, basically. Mm. Now, Facebook always wants your money. So after Facebook bought Instagram, they, had a lot, they have allowed any kind of ad to, uh, to be there. So as long as you pay, you can be there. Uh, so that means that um, nowadays it's really about figuring out what the best outlet would be hmm. uh, for your company. Um, Instagram is still mostly visual in nature. So if you have an aesthetic product, um, something that um, a designer product, let's say, uh, or, or uh, something that's very visually appealing, hmm. then Instagram will likely be the platform in which you will find people who will appreciate your offering. Hmm. Um, you can use pictures on Twitter, of course, but Twitter is more about being fun and quirky uh, and, and uh, being really, um, there's this notion of real-time marketing uh, where you just 
basically follow what happens in the world that day uh, and then make some funny pertinent comments about how those events tie in with your brand. And Twitter is optimal for that. So it also depends a little bit uh, on, on the type of brand that you have. Um, and it also depends a little bit on the type of, uh, let's say, social media personality that you want your brand to display. Uh, and one of my favorite examples here uh, is uh, Netflix, uh, because their social media personality is this uh, movie-loving, <laughs> crazy kind of fan who is happy to chat about movies and who loves everything new and who's really thrilled to engage in discussions about things like that. So, and that works on Twitter really well. Um, but Netflix is not really about, it's not the, a beauty brand. Uh, it's not a cosmetics brand. Uh, cosmetics brands usually do Instagram because um, it's very visual. And uh, uh, it's both about uh, images, but also videos. I have a feeling yes. that people under uh, appreciate the, yes. the video uh, feed on many of these. Absolutely. And I mean, TikTok really changed the game for, for, for videos. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what I think is so amazing is uh, how you can make people excited about something in 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. If we would have talked about, uh, let's say just 10 years ago, if we would have talked about selling something in 15 seconds, it would have been, wow, Crazy. that's yeah. really, you really have to be like, oh, that's so short. Like, how can we, how can we do that? Uh, it was only like these kinds of conversations were only had uh, in the context of Super Bowl ads that were so ridiculously expensive that you really had to limit yourself to that amount. So it was not about wanting to limit, it was more about, we can't afford more than 15 seconds. Um, but, but these days, it's more about uh, the bite size content. Uh, it's really about being so incredibly on target, on point with what you're doing, that people will get it in 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. You will go back to these examples. I, I actually wanted mm -hmm. to, to chat with you with some of the new, I don't even know if it's game marketing or gamification, but Pokemon, for example, or stuff. Uh, I, I love the way that they blended the physical world with the digital yes. world. And I wonder why they missed the opportunity to keep going with that. It kind of died out. But let's let's get back to that later. I want to hear you more about the other main methods. Mm -hmm. So what's this thing called influencer marketing? Yes. So... Uh... In the old days, uh, influencer didn't exist. We uh, had celebrities and we had uh, regular people. Um, but then uh, with the advent of uh, reality TV and uh, social media, uh, came the concept of uh, influencer marketing. Uh, An influencer is, I think you can call them celebrities, uh, but they are not movie stars um, or, or the kind of celebrities that we would traditionally think of. Uh, they are the kind of celebrities who come to the forefront, not necessarily because they have a specific talent, um, but because they're willing to expose themselves uh, to a certain extent. Um, and it started with the Kardashians, obviously. Uh, there's a well-known uh, Kardashian effect that shows that any product that is placed in the hands of a Kardashian will immediately uh, get more followers on social media, will get more exposure. Uh, it's it's a very, very strong effect. Hey, Maria, and, can I just hmm? ask you, um, so I wonder if this is an age thing. I never understood that Kardashian thing. There's like oh, zero neither. appeal, but but obviously people do because of the effect that you just described. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no. So uh, and, and what are we missing, uh, people? Uh, uh, people like me. I, I, first of all, I think we're too old. <laughs> uh, but second of all, uh, we didn't grow up with reality TV. Uh, it, it wasn't the kind of thing we grew up with. Beverly Hills. We uh, actually, my mother, she still thinks that when she watches TV. She wants to watch beautiful people because that's what she's paying for. Mm. And and that's just her, her whole mantra. And that's what TV was. It was very glamorous. It had nothing to do with real life. I mean, 
it, it was supposed to be aspirational in some way. Um, but now we have this whole generation that has grown up with reality TV. And now it's not about glamour, it's about authenticity. Uh, it, it, it's really about completely different things. Um, and that means that, that influencers who essentially are regular people, but who are willing to give you an, a window into their lives, uh, their supposedly real lives, um, they, they gain this almost cult-like status uh, among people. Um, so they become the celebrities of today. Um, and many, I don't know if we can call them older generation celebrities. Um, let's take an example. For example, uh, I, I, I was a huge fan of Madonna growing up. You know, I absolutely adored her. I, I, I still think she's fantastic. But it would never, ever occur to her to communicate with a fan directly on a page or on, on let's say, Instagram. Uh, it would never occur to her to, to, to meet and greet after a show. I mean, it just, it just didn't happen, you know? There was supposed to be a distance between the celebrity and the regular person. Uh, that's how it was. But these days it's completely different. That distance has shrunk. And now you're supposed to be, if you're a celebrity, you're supposed to be in constant connection with your audience, uh, constantly commenting on things and, and, and being in a completely different way uh, approachable, if we can use that concept. I don't think the Kardashians are approachable. I mean, they have bodyguards <laughs> everywhere, but just the concept of... of, of, yeah. of of approachability. Um, and, and it also has this element that anyone can be a celebrity. Um, and in the old days, it wasn't like that. I mean, I grew up in Finland. I would never have dreamed of, of becoming a celebrity. I mean, it just didn't exist. Uh, but these days, yeah, it does, it does exist. I, I think... Um... Uh, I've seen also ads being done for, you know, big brands like, uh, uh, let's say the, the Norwegian uh, Tram, uh, it's mm -hmm. a big thing in Norway, fish mm -hmm. oil. Uh, and there was this um, very uh, informally made uh, video of mm -hmm. a video recording with a young mm -hmm. uh, lady and one of the top sportsmen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was going to do, well, how are we going to do this? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm going to do some heavy lifting mm -hmm. or something. Said, no, 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 that's not how we do it. So mm -hmm. she filmed themselves, you know, in the kitchen running around. Yes. And, uh, exactly. and that was the ad. And so I think that we, the under, as you say, authentic or this, at least uh, this uh, myth of being a, a very real time, uh, natural, not over directed, you know, it's, it's this, faster lean mo movement um, and and I think we're getting there I, I think it's just um, there is there is a hidden kind of side to that medal I was on a bay uh, for mm -hmm. some work about a year ago mm -hmm. And, you know, and I was wondering, it looked like all the girls looked the same. They were all yeah. wearing yellow yeah. short sweaters, same style long hair, same mm -hmm. style uh, high rise uh, jeans, mm -hmm. same kind of uh, yeah. um, extensions. And, you know, so it must be some of these influencers mm -hmm. have a bigger grip on our reality than we, than yes. we realize. Yes. And, and uh, especially now, because they are influencers, which are like Kardashians and the like, and then they are micro influencers who have a local audience and micro influencers especially uh, because they are more targeted they have a more local audience are very very influential uh, when it comes to influencing a specific uh, target group uh, that they appeal to mm. but companies could create their own both internal and external micro influencers. And I Absolutely. think this is a really underestimated thing. I see many people try to do this with a podcast now, but I think that uh, what you really want to do is uh, uh, have, have a, a very strong positioning. You know, they start a podcast yes. about sustainability and that's every company's job now, but you know, how do you create that unique position? Yeah, and, it, it, and it's also about, you know, uh, reality shows are scripted. 
But the whole thing is that they're supposed to be seen as being unscripted. So it's not really reality, but it's an illusion of reality. Um, and anyone can create an illusion of reality. Um, but you will succeed if you have a script. And I know this sounds very paradoxical, but everything that seems real is usually engineered. Mm. So you shouldn't try to think that influencer marketing is about being authentic. No, it's about giving the impression of mm. being authentic. Uh, Through and, an engineered position. Yes, correct. Very, very interesting. So then we talked about email marketing. Let's yes. do that quickly. That's very traditional. Uh, I mean, basically, companies reach out to customers who agree to be contacted by them, uh, either to provide information, uh, to provide uh, news, or to give them specific offers. Hmm. And uh, you need a news, uh, an email list. That's the basic asset there. Yeah. And it's, uh, the, yeah. the, the trouble is maintaining that and, uh, and, and, and having automated tools that help you use that list efficiently. Yeah, but it's, it's again, I mean, uh, these are people who already buy from you, people who have agreed uh, to be on your list. So the potential there is more about maintaining uh, the relationship uh, and making sure that you're just informing them about campaigns and about things like that. It's not really about gaining new customers per se. No, but I have to ask you a question. So, um, you know, I have uh, several email addresses and one of them I use for all the personal stuff mm -hmm. and all the newsletter stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and I have to keep pruning that that email all the time. I unsubscribe daily, daily basically. Yeah. So what's the trick for, uh, you know, not being unsubscribed from? How do you, how do you, you know, is there, is there a frequency thing? Is there a content thing? Are we getting into content marketing now? Yeah. I mean, um, so here's the thing. Uh, a lot of people, again, because our attention spans are short, we get easily bored. So um, if you just keep sending information about campaigns, I mean, there's nothing new. We've seen that. So eventually we'll just figure out if we'll unsubscribe because there's nothing new uh, for us uh, in those specific messages. Uh, and especially if we get a lot of them and there's really nothing new coming our way, of course we're going to unsubscribe because that's just spam. So I think you have to be careful uh, with email marketing, how you use it. Uh, only use it when you really have something uh, to inform people. Uh, because if you do it too, too frequently and you don't have any new content, it will be perceived as spam. And I mean, the amount of emails people get these days is so ridiculously high uh, that it's just, I don't think that that should be where you put most of your money because it's very difficult for you to gauge your response. Mm -hmm. So, okay, somebody opened your newsletter, what does that mean? Sometimes I just click on things by mistake and then I'm like, oh yeah, and then I delete it. You have no information about uh, how relevant the, top, the, the content is. You, I mean, there's so little that you know on the basis of email marketing as compared with the other tools that we have all available these days. Yeah, I, I, I noticed with myself, so there are basically, uh, you know, two, three newsletters that I really appreciate. Mm -hmm. And they are, uh, what's common for them is that I have this fear of missing out. I feel that if I delete this one, uh, I, I don't have the time to read it, but I just mm -hmm. want to know that it's come to me and there is the option of learning something important from it. And so it's getting to that position, but I think that's, again, a very high requirement on the person who's writing them, yes. content-wise and basically yes. knowledge-wise. Yes. I mean, uh, again, coming back to my example of musicians, um, uh, I, I really like this um, Lord, the New Zealand-based uh, uh, singer. Uh, I think she's really great. Uh, she doesn't send out uh, news very often, but when she does, they are amazing. I mean, her mom is a poet, so the, the, her writing is just 
almost poetic. It's almost like uh, you get it and you are like, the, the way that she uses her words is just fantastic. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but she doesn't do that often. It's only now because she's going to be releasing a new album in, in, in August. And that I got two of these wonderful, curated, beautiful, poetic packages uh, into my inbox. And they gave you joy. They gave you something reading. Yes. Right? High value. Because they are so beautiful. Uh, and, and again, she's not really selling her album as much as talking about summer, how amazing it is to be able to go to the beach. And then at the end, yeah, by the way, my new album will be out. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and it's it, and it's very personal. Uh, it's very personal uh, uh, and, and, and it's almost like she's giving us a, I, I get a glimpse into her diary. Mm. Um, but again, she doesn't send them out often. Uh, and that's also the trick, you know, um, know your audience. Uh, and she's the kind of person who doesn't want to spam her audience unless she really has something to say. I'm trying to look through my email box now. So um, uh, the, I, I, I simply can't remember. Uh, there, is a, there is a woman who does something similar like that. She's called Maria something Eastern. And uh, brain, um, it's not brain teaser, yes. it's brain snacks. I love it. I'm I'm on the email listing too. Yeah, yeah, you, you yeah. Know, she she writes about so, books, and she yes, writes about yes. and you know she makes you think, and she she writes once or twice a week, and I love it. And uh, yes. and uh, similarly, there is a an email list from something called CB Insights, so probably corporate business or something mm -hmm. like that. Insights, uh, Silicon Valley based. There is a, mm -hmm. an Indian guy called Anand, who mm -hmm. was the first writer of these emails. Now there is mm -hmm. a bigger team. And they write about um, venture capital mm -hmm. and entrepreneurship and tech. Mm -hmm. uh, they they are very good. They have very yeah. good data. So they always give you some interesting uh, graphs. I feel yeah. like, you know, I learned most yeah. of the stuff I need to learn there. And they write funny. So every email yeah. starts with a yeah. really funny topic. topic yeah, yeah. And there is always a tongue in cheek, uh, you know, graph or or they always make me smile and I yeah. never spend more than 30 seconds on it, yes. but I would not be without it in my email. Yes. So I think it's, but both Maria and Anand and this Lord, I think they found a unique voice. And, and I think we underappreciate how important the str strength of that unique voice is both in email marketing, but also all other marketing. Yeah. And I, I also think we underestimate that it, it should be personal. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, when you read the, 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 the newsletter from Maria, I can see what kind of person she is. I get a feel for, I, I, I can imagine her in my head, mm -hmm. although I have exactly. never met her. Uh, exactly. And, and the same thing with Lord. But a lot of, 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 of marketing in the old days used to be out, have professional content, very standardized writings, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that just doesn't work anymore because it's boring and it's not personal in any way. It doesn't feel relevant. Um, so, so, so I think you're into something very important because with this digital and also hyper personalized, you need to find a, a voice, I think, as a company or as mm. an individual that that makes people want to hear from you. Yes. Because, you know, you inspire them, you move yes. them, you teach them, you do something with them. Yeah. Other, other than that, you have to have an absolutely mind blowingly good offers in that email mm. that that you that you can't, you know, miss. But a lot of times companies feel it's risky to, mm. to be, to, to, to be to personal. Mm. Uh, and, and like Anand, I, I, I think I got one of his emails from CB Insights and it said something like, I love you, Anand. And I was like, he always signs, I love you. Anand. Yeah. And I, I was like, no, no, you don't. <laughs> yeah. Anand, you don't know me. Like, there is a long discussion of that in yeah. the newsletter. <laughs> yeah, but a lot of companies, they would never go there. They would never, ever go there. They would never take the risk of, of saying something personal. Mm. They keep it very, uh, very clear cut, very textbook. 
in many ways. Yeah. I, I, uh, you know, he's he's uh, he's playing a risky game. I agree with you, and we, mm -hmm. we we're not going to get through our examples otherwise. But I just have to make <laughs> a comment because you know, at one point he was uh, showing they they love uh, bad graphs, mm -hmm. and so. There was an email about how marketing people don't understand numbers, <laughs> and uh, and he was showing a, a graph where you know the, the the title of the graph said something about you know one quarter of the market did and, and you, you see very clearly it's one third of the market on the on the pie chart, and so it is a risky game because he's very very provocative in many yes, ways. I know, um, and he's quoting people uh, when they when they make you know a really st stupid comment and this could be corporate big big corporate ceos uh but that's why it's made it's interesting right because I all know. the polished stuff i know i know but but that's the problem that most companies they don't know how to do that exactly. uh, they don't know how to be quirky they don't know how to be personal and they only know how to be corporate mm. and that doesn't appeal to people anymore mm. people want personality uh, people want you to be someone. I mean, in the old in the old days, you know, you didn't have to take sides. These days, you have to take sides, and you have to stand for something because otherwise, you stand for nothing. And and in the old days, you were supposed to stand for nothing, but these days, mm -mm, it doesn't work like that anymore. Oh, I think uh, we could go long, long way here now uh, on ethical marketing. Yeah. Uh, and uh, especially now in the Pride Month that was, yeah. there were some companies that went very far in that direction. Yeah. But uh, but I think in the interest of time, Maria, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll, maybe we'll get back to that later. Mm -hmm. uh, what What is, uh, so let's, let's do very quickly, content marketing, SEO marketing, and video marketing. Content marketing is basically any kind of content that you produce for your brand. Um, and I, I think it is, in, in the old days, again, it, it was about having polished text, uh, no spelling mistakes, you know, just a very, very traditional kind of copy. Uh, but these days it's more about having interesting and relevant content. And yes, it is often quirky. It can be offbeat. Uh, but it's it's supposed to it's supposed to trigger something. Mm -hmm. um, SEO is just a search engine optimization, so it's just about how you make sure that when somebody Google's, for example, your product, that you come up on top and not at the very bottom. Uh, usually, it involves giving Google a bag of money. So, so, yeah, and, and I think that's become a little bit too much of a science. So, yeah, uh, it's over -engineered. content marketing is very much about the quality of your content. If you, mm -hmm. if you don't have good content, then please don't do content marketing. Uh, it's about teaching people something through your content. I think whole learn is sort of a content marketing project, but yes. for the whole society. And, and when it comes to SEO, I, I, I think, Maria, that there is a whole industry that's growing in the shadows of this that I am not sure I really like, uh, but it has to do with figuring out the algorithms of Google and Facebook yeah, yeah. and so on, and then in a way hacking them and getting on the top. And the whole point of these algorithms is to try to give people, sometimes paid, but also relevant content. So, you know, if you create very relevant content, Hopefully, with some money, perhaps, mm -hmm. you would get to the top. Yeah, and don't yeah, try yeah. to put in hidden words and uh, all kinds of other weird things, right? Yeah, but there's also the thing that people don't like being fooled. So if you put in keywords that are not really applicable, I mean, yeah. So I go to a Google search, uh, I put in some keywords, and then I some names pop up, and then I click on it, and I'm like, what the heck? What is this? Why did this come up? It's not relevant at all. And then I just get annoyed, you know? Hmm. Um, and of course now uh, Google already has an image, image search in place. It's not that widely used yet, but, but it is available. And then we have another ball game there again, because <laughs> that's going to be engineered too. Uh, I don't think it's too engineered yet because it's not, it hasn't widely, it's not widely used yet. Um, but it, I, I, I'm absolutely confident that in the future, because people are much more compelled by images than by text, uh, 
I mean, that's why voice search is also so incredibly popular. Um, but but the image search will will start to become more and more important. Uh, I, th I think then, people don't even know how to use image search. So basically, when I go on Google, and one of those choices is images, uh, that's giving me then all the images related to my keyword. But no, I no, guess no. there is still a keyword. H how how do I give them an image to to, to search? No, it's a different. Uh, you need to do. You need to use a different browser. It's not that one. It's another. It's a different page. Yeah, hmm. yeah. So and I give them one, an image, and they give me yes. related things. Yes. Yes. So uh, let's say, uh, for example, uh, after uh, my grandmother was very, very close to me. And uh, when she passed, uh, it was devastating in many ways. Uh, but I, one of the things that I wanted to do, I, I, I wanted to keep, uh, she, my, my grandmother loved jewelry and nice clothing and things like that. And, and uh, of course, I got a, a big part of that. And sometimes, you know, there would be a missing earring. Uh, or something. Uh, and then I could upload it on Google Image Search and see if I find any hits for it so that I could hopefully buy a pair. What? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you can you can do image search for anything. So let's say hypothetically you are uh, you travel to Spain and, and you see something really nice uh, outside someone's home. Uh, you take a picture of it. Uh, then you can basically query that picture to Google and see where you can find a similar thing. Very cool. I'll try that. So yeah. So, but it, it's not it's not widely used yet. No. Uh, so it hasn't been over engineered at this point. Yeah. Uh, but I think it will increase in importance in the future just because we are incredibly visual as people. Yeah. In in my in my uh, in my uh, life, I often see a piece of art or something, and you know, yeah, who exactly. That? Who made yeah, that? You know, exactly. that that would be a wonderful exactly. uh, way to figure out. So, um, and video marketing, that is already much used, but not as a search thing, but rather than as a push thing, right? Yeah, uh, and video marketing is actually very very uh, efficient uh, because. Uh, any kind of engagement report uh, that we can see on social media shows that people are way more engaged with video content than they are with uh, any other type of content. Mm. So if you can create a video of, of your product, that's usually much better. Um, but again, a short video. <laughs> 60 second video. Um, and I, I think one thing that we've learned in Learn is that it doesn't have to be as over engineered as people think. It could be basically, a, you know, a set of uh, six good images mm -hmm. with with some nice, mm -hmm. interesting text mm -hmm. related to each of them. And today, pretty much any 20 year old can create this for you. Yes. Yes. Uh, while before you had to have a very kind of uh, rare uh, video, digital video mm -hmm. uh, skilled person. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely true. Absolutely true. Easy to make uh, very, very. Uh, efficient in marketing, as yes. you say. It, it, and the last the, thing, sorry. It's the prime driver of engagement. All the mm. studies show that, so. And the last one is uh, web advertising. So just very briefly, what's that? That's basically just uh, placing an ad uh, on, for example, Amazon's uh, web page, on Google's web page, um, any web page that you think could drive traffic uh, to your web page. It is it is a placing a product in Amazon catalog, or it's you know paying them money for you to put uh, you know a banner, or yes. so typically in the newspapers in Norway it would be the biggest uh, online newspapers, for example. Yes, yes, mm. yes. But actually, okay. uh, Google uh, they get a lot of money from placed web ads. Uh, so basically, imagine that your your web page is a space that you can sell. Uh, and then you can sell, I don't know, maybe one fifth of that space uh, to people who think that you can drive traffic to their website. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's say that I think that the New York Times would be a great way to get people to come to Learn's uh, webpage. Then uh, Learn could place an ad on New York Times and get traffic directed from there to their webpage. Mm -hmm. Very, very good. Uh, Maria, 
We are going mm -hmm. back to myths in our next conversation yes. and the pitfalls. But I really want you to, now we have very short time, but uh, we talked about examples as long mm -hmm. as, as we went. But uh, if we could talk briefly about why do you love Spotify yeah. as, a, as an example? What about Heinz Ketchup and TikTok? Yeah. And what about Fitbit stories? So, um, first of all, I actually do not use Spotify. I use Apple Music. <laughs> So the reason why I like Spotify is because of their excellent marketing, not because I'm a user of the, the specific product. Uh, but Spotify, uh, they are targeting millennials. And every single thing that they do is so incredibly customized and tailored for that specific market, down to the colors that they use on their web page, to the fun, quirky ads that make music references and are often very funny. They really know their audience so well. And they are giving them a lot of things. So remember, this is the generation that didn't grow up with mixtapes. Well, guess what? Spotify gives you the chance to create a digital mixtape and share it with a friend. Uh, they give you the chance. They have this lovely thing um, called Only You. And they ask you to imagine which artists you would invite to a dinner party. And then on that basis, they create a playlist for you. And again, it's a very simple question. Who would you invite for a dinner party? I mean, it's a wonderful exercise in imagination for anyone who likes music. Um, and then the playlist is uh, automatically created for you on that basis. You can share it with others. I mean, it's just a such an incredibly... They have so in so much knowledge about their audience and they really, really try to meet their audience's needs every single step of the way. And, and that's what I think make, makes them so incredibly good at what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And this also comes down to they are incredibly consistent. Everywhere that they are, the message is the same. So, and, and that's something that I think a lot of companies when they do traditional ads, for example, they tend to diverge from whatever you see on their web page. It shouldn't. Everything should be coherent, consistent, and compelling. And then they also have these uh, communities and blogs, yes, and as you say, yes. you know, they, they keep working on yes. you and yes. giving you something, yes. and you return it by a loyal usage. Yes, and, and it's also like they take an interest in you, you know? They want to learn about you. They want to learn about your preferences and they measure and they track and they pivot and adapt. Mm. So. Very good. Cool. Uh, we, what about uh, ketchup? Yeah. So uh, this is another example that uh, I love because, um, you know, Halloween last year was a bit of a bummer because of COVID. You couldn't really go outside and, uh, well, a lot of the festivities that were typically associated with that were, well, you were not able to really engage in that in the same way. Uh, but one of the things that Heinz knows is that almost every household has a bottle of ketchup. It's, it's one of those basic staple items that everyone has. So they asked people to come up with a Halloween story involving ketchup. And if you came up with a really good story, they gave you a limited edition of something called Heinz Blood Ketchup. And it ties in with the Halloween theme so well. And this campaign was a fantastic success. And what I really like about it is it, it really engaged people from all ages. So you had children asking their grandparents uh, to come up with a story involving Heinz Ketchup. And people were so creative. They came up with these really crazy murder stories uh, to, to really lovely family stories. Um, and, and that's really the only thing that they did was they gave people an incentive to be creative themselves. They just planted the seed and it sprung into this amazing, wonderful blooming tree. <laughs> and that's really what I like about that. But to me, it was also a very brave uh, campaign because basically they uh, 
they they uh, use TikTok, if I understand you correctly, yes. as the main channel. Yes. And they are not exactly, you know, versed in TikTok to start with. No, but that was clever because this gave them a way in and, and this gave them so many followers that they previously didn't have. Precisely because they chose something uh, that wasn't their traditional market channel. Mm. So sometimes these kinds of risks, they definitely pay off. Um, I, I'm just thinking of the brave, uh, you know, head of marketing mm -hmm. who said yes, yes to a proposal like yes. this, because usually yes. they would say, ah, oh, well, you know. Yeah, yeah. but <laughs> I, cool. in some ways, COVID was also a way, a, a lot of companies were willing to take risks during COVID because there was very little you could do in terms of traditional marketing. A lot of the traditional outlets were not available. So then that tilted the balance a little bit for some to be willing to take risks. Very cool. Maria, in one minute, Fitbit yeah. stories. Yeah, so Fitbit stories, uh, this is something that I like because they bring the voice of the customer to the forefront. So instead of trying to sell something, they're just having people tell their stories uh, about how Fitbit changed their lives. Uh, and they're opening up a dialogue and a platform uh, for talking about uh, something that can be very sensitive, weight loss, fitness. Um, and, and they had people with disabilities talk about how fitness, uh, how their technology helped them uh, overcome things and, and really realize their fitness goals. So it's really a story about overcoming obstacles um, with the use of a specific product without necessarily pushing the product at the forefront but pushing the voice of the customers and their stories and allowing them to be heard. I'd love to do that with Learn, by the way. So, uh, you know, have one, one, say, tenth of our cases recorded, nominated by customers or by students, by readers, by listeners mm -hmm. on, you know, what's their most interesting learning from the past 12 months. And uh, maybe finding a way to also, uh, you know, uh, produce that in a more distributed way. So I, I think this idea of, you know, uh, crowdsourcing, crowd creation yes. is something we need to look at much, much more. And companies um, need to learn from things like Fitbit. Maria, thank you so very much for um, my pleasure. session number two. And uh, we'll continue with the myths and yes. uh, more on concrete examples in the next one. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Du har nå lyttet til en podcast fra learn.tech, en læringsdugnad om teknologi og samfunn. Nå kan du også få et læringssertifikat for å lytte til denne podcasten på vårt online-universitet learn.university.